Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for the blessed hope when we have Christ. Lord God, I pray that we would be so enthralled with the glory and the sovereignty and the power and the grace and the mercy that we have when we find salvation in Christ alone. That that would push away fear, that would push away worry and concern because we would understand the reality that if we have you, what more could we want? Well, God, be with us this morning. Be with us as we turn to your word that your spirit would open our eyes to its truth and that we would be transformed by your living word. Continue to conform your people to the image of your beloved son. Continue to show your glory through your people. Lord God, be with us this morning. Help us to see you in new ways. May your name be made famous through this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Just a little side note before I jump into the things this morning. I don't know about you, but, and this is no, this is no um, hack towards Daniel and his singing this morning, but when I hear that last song, I can't help but think of Ray Lynn, McElroy. Daniel did an excellent job, I do want to say that though. But I, 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 the reason they're on my mind specifically is because I hear that song, I hear her voice and she's not here singing today because her and Justin this morning probably before the sun rose, got on a plane. They are flying to Haiti to have kind of their last final conversations and discussions with Mission Hope in Haiti, uh, trying to figure out exactly what, what they'll be doing as they um, hopefully, Lord willing, will be moving into full-time missions in Haiti in the near future. So please be in prayer with them over the next couple days as they go on this whirlwind trip to Haiti to, to meet some of the, the, uh, the administrators and some of the, the leaders there and uh, discuss some of the final details and then they'll be coming back uh, middle of the week, end of the week. So keep them in prayer. If you have a Bible, open up to 1 Samuel chapter 14. We are working through the book of Samuel. We have a, a, a dramatic change happening in the, in the nation of Israel. There is now a king If you remember last week, we, we kind of began what, what, what is a little bit of a, a couple chapters of dealing with, with a battle that is brewing between the Philistines, which are a, a people that lived along the coast in the southern, western part of Israel. That was the, primarily their home area, but, but the Philistines had power and authority that they were opposing upon the Israelites. And Saul is moving around trying to avoid fighting this army that is huge and his army is scared they are fleeing they are hiding in caves they are running away and so we come here now to chapter 14 of first samuel if you have a bible read with me verses 1 to 23 one day jonathan the son of saul said to the young man who carried his armor Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the, outskir on the outskirts of Gebeah in the, in the pomegranate cave or, or, or by the pomegranate tree, depending on your translation, in Migron. So he is not at the front line. He is a little bit back. Saul is a little bit back. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including uh, Ahijah, the son of Ahatub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone within the pass by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison. There was a rocky crag 
on one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of one was Bozaz and the name of the other Shina. And the one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash, which is where the Philistines are camped, and the other on the south in front of Gebeah. And, and as I was reading through this, I just want to give you a little bit of a picture. Uh, the only thing that came to mind is, can we, do we have that picture? Can you put that picture up? So, so for a while, my family lived in Salt Lake City, um, and, and, and these are the mountains on the east side of Salt Lake City. And at sunset, these mountains, this was the best picture I could find that kind of conveyed this, but at sunset, there were mountains to the west. They were all dark, and they literally looked like a bunch of teeth. But then if you looked east, these mountains shine. They, they were like glow. And uh, it, was, it was a beautiful thing. And so you have these two mountains being described here. This one, Boaz, which, which actually means thorn. So one side you have a dark thorn, if you will. And then the other one is, is Senna, or, 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 or excuse me, Senna, which, which actually means shiny or, 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 or glowing. So you can imagine that, that depending on how this sat here, one side is dark and one side, and, and, and I want to point out the, the side that's shining is because the Israelites are on the side where as the sun would set, that side would glow. Now right on top of the glowing sign is a campment, a high ground where the Philistines are camped out. So you have this picture of a, a dark side and a, and a bright side, and on the other side of the bright side, you have the enemy camped on top of the mountain. Continue on, verse 6. Jonathan said to the young men who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, Look, Hebrews are coming out of their holes where they have hidden themselves. And the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and say, Come up to us, and we will show you a thing. I love that line. Come on up to us. We'll teach you something. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor bearer behind him and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killing them after him and that first strike within Jonathan and his armor bearer made killing about 20 men within an area that was half a furrow's length of an acre of land and there was a panic in the camp and in the field and among all the people the garrison and even the raiders trembled and the earth quaked and it became a very great panic stop here and explain a few things they say okay maybe perhaps God has something for us here's what we're going to do here's how we'll know if God is wanting us to go there or wanting us to stay we're going to show ourselves show ourselves to them I don't know if they called out stood out there and the Philistines said hey come on up here it's two of them against the garrison All right, I want you to be sure you're, you're understanding here two guys only one guy actually has a sword and a shield. The other guy, his armor bearer, when he's not holding Jonathan's stuff, has like, I don't know, a pitchfork or, or, or a rake or something. That's his weapon. They show themselves. He says, come on up to here. The, the, come on up here, the Philistines say. So they crawl down the dark side, go through the wadi, which is the dry riverbed at the bottom. They come up on the, 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 the glowing, shiny side on their hands and knees, and they put down 20 men. Saul knocks them down, injures them, wounds them. His armor bearer makes sure they're dead. And they keep advancing forward. And 20 of them are struck. And chaos breaks out in the, in, in the camp. There is 
There is worry, there is fear, there is an earthquake. Gee, I wonder who's helping them. And literally, depending on the translation you have, but, but mine, the ESV here at the very end says, and there was a very great panic. Literally in the Hebrews it said there's a Shekinah, or a glorious panic. Again, connecting God to what's happening here. Two men crawl down a ravine, crawl up the other side, kill 20 guys, and chaos breaks out. Continue on, verse 16. And the watchmen of Saul at Gebeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude was dispersing here and there, talking about the Philistines. They see, look, there's, there's something going on here. People are running. There, there's craziness happening. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Count and see who has gone from us. And when they had counted, behold, Jonathan, which again, I want to point out, he's his son. He doesn't know his son's missing. Great father. And his armor bearer were not there. So Saul says to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here. Literally, it, it's probably what he's bringing is, is the, the uh, ephod, which would be worn, which often the ephod and the ark are compared to two things because both of them showed the presence of God. For the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. Now while Saul was talking to the priests, the tumult in the, tumult in the, in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priests, withdraw your hand. Hear what's happening. Something's going on over there in the Philistines' camp. Quick, let's see if God wants us to go. The priest is, is reaching into the ephod where the Uma and the Thuma is. They're, they're two stones that they would often throw down. And, and, and you, if you see casting lots in the Old Testament, that's what he's talking about. So the priest is reaching in. He's about to commune with God. And Saul says, forget it. We don't got time for this. Let's go. Verse 20. And Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and they went into the battle and behold, every Philistine sword was against his fellow and there was very great confusion. Now the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines before that time and who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, with all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim, heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day. And they battled beyond beth Even. So again, bringing some clarity here to, to fill in some dots if you weren't here in the previous weeks. Saul says, we don't got time to, to talk to God Something's happening. We got to get there. They get there. I love this. Saul, who is panicking and, and worried because the Philistines were like sand on the seashore and he only had 600 men. So he's trying to avoid the Philistines, trying to avoid conflict. He was at Gilgal. They're at Michmash. He, he comes around. He flanks them to get over where his son Jonathan is, trying to gather his forces. You realize, all I got is 600 people. I'm going to hang back from the front line until God does something amazing. They get there, the Philistines are killing themselves. All I got is 600 people. God's like, I don't even need 600. They will fall by their own hand. Another amazing thing that you have these Israelites who basically are mercenaries. They are siding with the Philistines and they realize this is not going well for the people who pay us. Let's go back to our people. Last week we read about the people who were hiding in the caves or some people crossed the Jordan for safety. They hear what's going on and all of a sudden they're like, let's go. It's kind of like when your favorite team is whoever won the most recent game. You know, my best friend's a, a diehard Mets fan and for most of his life it was miserable. And all of a sudden, when the Mets won the World Series, everybody's like, oh, we love the Mets. Really? You've been a Yankees fan ever since I've known you. This is what's happening. They are like, we are now with the Israelites because the Israelites have God behind them. This is an amazing passage here, and, 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 and I love when we take time to look at Old Testament passages because often I think we view them just as some story that's about people far away a long time ago, and we don't see that there's a connection to us. 
But if you look here at verses one through six, we have this setup of, of what's happening that, that's gonna set up not only today, but then next week and, and a little bit into the future. You, you hear right in verse one, here's a plan. The plan's a secret. Jonathan won't inform his father. You might wonder why. Why doesn't Jonathan tell his dad what's going on? Perhaps Jonathan knew his dad would forbid it. It could also be displaying that there's a difference. There's already a divide happening between Jonathan and his father Saul. You'll see this played out a little bit more when David comes on the scene in a couple weeks. Jonathan trusts the Lord and, and pursues these people. And Saul's hiding, holding himself back. Here's the plan, secret plan. Don't tell my dad, he'll tell us no. Jonathan on the front line, secret plan. Here's what we're going to do. Way back there in the safe spot in the comfort of the camp are the leaders. Look who the two leaders are. You have a priest and you have a king. Saul was told in chapter 13, your dynasty is not going to last. It ends with you. And he's there at the camp with the priest Ahijah, who is the grandson of Phineas. Phineas, if you'll remember, way back is one of the worthless sons of Eli. And God condemns Eli and his sons and says, your priestly line will come to an end. So you have two leaders who are both from disposed lines, li line lineages that are no longer going to continue. They're going to be the ones supposedly leading. And then you have a place, and a possible place. We've got to climb down this ravine. We've got to climb up safely to the other side. And when we get there, hopefully we have enough energy to fight. But here's the, here's the secret. Here's really the secret. Take a look at verse 6. Jonathan said to the young men who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Listen, here's, here it is. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Church, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. This isn't some sort of optimistic statement. The Hebrew that's translated maybe or perhaps isn't meant to be a sign like, I'm not really sure, you know, it, it could go maybe, you know, 50-50, maybe 60-40, I'm not really sure, but, but maybe that, that's not what's being conveyed in, in the original language. It's actually arising from this understanding that God can do this. But there's no guarantee. The Philistines are encamped on the high ground. They have the tactical position. There's only two guys. One guy with actual weapon, another guy with some farming implement. And, 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 and did I mention there's a ravine? I don't know if rock climbing was a hobby back then. But I've seen people climb up and down things who have no experience climbing. And they are not toting a shield or a sword. And if you're not an active climber, you will find that after you climb up a mountainside, your arms are generally pretty tired. Because most, I'll put this on men, most men when they're climbing, rock climbing, you rely on your arms. You pull yourself up. You don't realize your legs are way stronger. Get a foothold and just stand up. Adjust your hands. Move your feet up. No, not men. We're like, we got strong arms. We climb up there. Can you imagine climbing up a mountain and then having to wield a shield and a sword? Not made of some space age material. I mean like heavy metal. But look what Jonathan says. It shows his faith in the Lord, a faith superior to his own father's. He says, nothing, nothing can hinder the Lord. What can hinder him? What could hamper him? What can slow him? What can stop him? Nothing. Jonathan is affirming that God doesn't need vast numbers. He doesn't need a giant army. He doesn't even need 600. He, 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 he could do it even with two guys 
nothing, nothing can hinder God from saving. Note here that, that Jonathan's not trusting in his plan and in his strength. He's trusting. He's moving forward. He's making a decision. And all of it is rooted in his trust and faith in God's ability, not his own. We come across passages like this frequently in the scriptures, and, and we should pause and we should we should take time to wonder why does God frequently choose to save this way? Why does God frequently choose to use a handful or, or a small number to do his mighty thing? I believe there's a couple reasons and, and, and I don't have enough time to go through, through all of them but, but I believe God, God chooses to save this way because it reveals that God's the one who's omnipotent. I think sometimes we, we, we think we're way stronger, we're way more powerful and able than we really are. But it is God who has all power. Nothing is impossible for Him plenty of things are impossible for us. I think it also shows that God is sovereign. He's the one who's in control of, of things. He has the authority. When, when they get to the other side, who's actually winning the war? Not Jonathan and his armor bearer. But God has turned the Philistines on themselves. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Even the things that we think are impossible. I also think God chooses to act this way because it drives his people and others to humility. If you go and do something that you know you can't do through your own intellect, through your own power, through your own strength, and God does something mighty, you don't walk out patting yourself on the back saying, I'm amazing. You instead come humble praising God and say, did you see what God just did? I thought he would do this much, but instead he did that. How can we boast in our plans, in our wisdom, when we see what has happened and said, there's no way I did that by myself? If, you have a, if you're a parent or if you've been around kids, you, you've experienced this a little bit. Have you ever had kids and you're maybe bringing in groceries and they say, can I help? And you're thinking, there's no way you're going to lug the 50-pound bag of dog food. But what do you do? You slide to the end of the car. You pretend like you're putting it on their shoulder and you walk alongside them carrying it. And they get there and they're like, did you see what I did? And you're like, yeah, I did. Great job, son. And as they get older, they realize because they understand, man, I really didn't do that much. It was really by the power and the mercy of God. I am truly am inept. Many of us this morning, the reality is many of us this morning are unaware that we are surrounded by an enemy. Many of us this morning are, are, are unaware that we are under the authority and the power and control of something else. And it might not be a physical foreign army the way the Philistines were to Israel but we're surrounded, we're covered, we're, we're impacted by the power and the authority of a curse. There's sin everywhere. And again, I, I, wanna, I, want, us, I want us to think here, it's not just out there, it's in here. We, we, we battle it and it controls us and there are times we just wish man I wish I could just throw off the shekels of this and then we fall back into it again and again and we are ill equipped and we are outnumbered and if you don't think it's there all you need to do is just take time and turn on the news and realize what has gone on with this world Or go to a funeral. Every funeral I've ever been at, 
minus one, someone has come up to me and said, this isn't right, or this isn't how it should be. And my response is, you're right. This isn't normal. It, it, it's normal, but it isn't. This isn't how it was meant to be. Beloved, I, I, I don't know what you're facing. I, I don't know the circumstances that each of you are in. I don't know maybe how you're being attacked by the, by, by the, by the effects or the outcome of the fall and the curse. But, but I want you to remember, I plead with you to remember this. Regardless of what you're facing, regardless of what your physical eyes see, regardless of what your, your heart is maybe saying, this is right, this is where you should do, and, and, and you follow after those sinful desires. Regardless of those situations, I want you to remember this. Nothing can hinder God from saving. Nothing can hinder God. He doesn't require a massive army. And the defeat of the greatest enemy that is against us has actually already occurred, and he did it through one man. The king of the universe sent his son to descend the thorny path to the valley of death and he rose up on the other side the glorious shiny reflective side victoriously Jesus is the dead and risen warrior who fights for his people because of his death and resurrection because of the death and resurrection of a greater king and a greater son people will rise in victory as well. Brothers, sisters, do you find yourself in a hopeless situation? Do you find yourself maybe facing a circumstance that you're thinking, man, that's impossible. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, the answer, of course, is yes. Of course I am. Of course there, there's things I, I don't think I know how to, how to handle. Or, or of course when I realize, man, sin is everywhere. And every day I wake up and I say, I'm not going to do it again. And I go and do it again. And then the next day I beat myself up about it. And I say, I'm not going to do it today. And then I get out of bed and I do it again. So of course, yes, I'm facing hopeless situations. But no, no. Of course you're not facing a hopeless situation. If you are a Christian, you have hope because you have Christ. Victory is already won on your behalf. He can save you. He has saved you. He will continue to save you. There is no hopeless situation. Christian, you have been redeemed from the full effect of the curse. I know you're still fighting to put it to death, but don't be so short-sighted to think what is right before you is the only thing that's before you. If you're found in Christ, you have salvation. So really what is before you is to set your eyes on what is truly yours. Stop looking at yourself and saying, I'm worthless. I, I, I can't do anything. Instead, start looking at yourself through the eyes of God and say, you are redeemed. You are beloved. You are cared for. You are in my hand. I got you. The old is gone. The new has come. Christian, when, when God saves us, he saves us for a purpose. And that purpose isn't comfort. It's not ease but you're saved for a purpose. Church, God delights to save through those who trust in him. Let me say that again. God delights to save through those who trust in him. As you're reading through this passage, it's, it's as if Jonathan is saying, who knows what Yahweh might delight to do against those uncircumcised fools? I, I don't know what the exact outcome's going to be, 
But I know God enough to know that he delights to save, and I know God enough that he often saves through people. If you read through everything that happens up until this point, I mean, go back. How does God save? He sends Abraham to win back his family and to defeat those who captured them. Who saved there? God did, using Abraham. The Israelites are, are enslaved to Egypt. Who saved them? Who brought them out? Well, Moses did. Through God. Who brought down the, the, the tumbling walls? Well, well, Jonathan led the army. But God did the mighty work. Excuse me, not Jonathan, Joshua. Jonathan doesn't know the exact outcome. I love this. This is such a beautiful picture of faith. There's no special message. Jonathan's phone doesn't ring. He doesn't get a text message or an email from God saying, here's the plan. Here's what you're going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. Deal. No specific promise is given. No promise of victory. No promise of safety. No promise of of, of assurance that the rest of the Israelites will, will rally behind you, Jonathan. All Jonathan knows is God has promised this land to us. God has promised to walk with us. God has promised to be our strength. He has promised to be our, our shield and our defender. He has promised to be faithful to those who are faithful to him. Let's go see what God will do. And so Jonathan moves forward armed with his faith in the Lord and God saves his people through Jonathan Jonathan's an example for us I don't know what God has in store but I'm going to faithfully step out in obedience a couple weeks we'll get to David David stands before a giant Philistine no guarantee of victory just hope and faith that the Lord will be with him. David's our example. Of course, Jesus, trusting the Father, comes to earth. No guarantee of, of comfort and ease. Faces rejection and death. But God mightily uses him to save his people. How will we know what God has for us? How will we know what God might mightily do through us if we're unwilling to step out in faith. If you look through scripture, you should be encouraged to see that God consistently uses his faithful people and they often don't know what, what, what stands before them, but they know enough, they, they know the promises, they know what God has already done in their own life and in the lives of others or in the life of, of people in the scripture, and they say, I know that that's the God I serve. I'm going to step out in faith. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know that I can trust him. I know that he's faithful. God can do mighty things. God may do mighty things, but we won't be partakers of it. We won't be observers of it until we step out in faith. I got a little bracket here, a little side. It's, it's a side thing, but it's not. Are we more like Saul? Are we more like, I'll hang back until I know the exact plan and, and the exact outcome before I'm willing to step out. Maybe when, when I have the divine map laid before me and I see all of the steps, then I'll, then I'll follow. We need to, to take what we know in the Lord and just do something. I've had conversations with people and, and, and it hasn't been exactly this but I'm putting it in this way just to maybe shelter some people I've had conversations with where someone will say something like I believe God's calling me into the mission field I'm just waiting for clarity so I know the exact you know, country or nation that, that he has called me to and, and, and my reply to those situations is really? 
because I know without a doubt that God has called his disciples to make disciples who, who share the gospel and, and raise up brothers and sisters in the Lord. And there's plenty of us right around here who need that. But you're going to hold back until God tells you, I want you to go to East Asia. Well, God hasn't shown me the right person to share with. Really, who do you interact with on a daily basis? Because whether they are a believer or a non-believer, you still can be doing these things. Are we more like Saul, where we just hang back and I'll wait until everything's figured out, see that things are going the way I want them to go, and then I'll join in? Sometimes we just need to do things. Single person, a great example. I went to a Christian college. Every guy is looking for a wife and every woman is looking for a husband. And I don't know how many times I heard conversations, well, God just hasn't shown me the right person. And I just want to say, she's a Christian, you're a Christian. You can actually get along. <laughs> wow. Maybe that's a sign right there. No. Right? Like, we, we often think, we, 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 put these, we put these like massive hoops. Well, God will show me, but let me give a list of, of, of all the things God needs to show me before I will faithfully pursue something or somebody. I think we need to be careful. There's a great book I want to encourage you if you haven't read it or if you have a list. Um, there's a great book written by Kevin D. Young, who's a pastor in, in Michigan. And the book's called this, Just Do Something. But I love the sub subtitle. Here's the subtitle. Or, how to make a decision without dreams, visions, fleeces, impressions, open doors, random Bible verses, casting lots, liver shivers, writing in the sky, etc. Just do something. Jonathan does not know how the exact outcome is going to be. And he's like, but I know who God is. We need to do something. You with me, armor bearer? The armor is like, I'm with you and they step out in faith just do something beloved brothers sisters open your eyes lift your heads up and look around the neighborhood look around where you work look around St. Joe there are so many opportunities where we can serve and minister as individuals and as a church but sometimes we just need to step forward and say I don't know what this is going to look like but I know what I'm called to do I'm going to just do it close bracket I pray I pray that Sojourn Church would be filled with faithful servants who trust in the Lord as they step out in faith I pray that we would be obedient to the Lord even when we don't have guarantees I pray that we would be obedient even when it's not easy the promise of physical safety and comfort they're not guaranteed to us often stepping out in faith is not going to be easy and comfortable it's, it's often even going to cost you but, but, but hear this God delights to save through those who trust in him example from my own life when I was a teenager I always was like man why doesn't God do anything cool by me I hear about a friend and it's like man that's amazing why doesn't God do anything like that well I was never faithful in doing the things that I was called to do and as I started to have conversations as I started to to step out I, I began to see like man God does still do things today but I have to put myself where the action's happening, not in the comfort of my bedroom. I have to put myself on the, on, on the front line. He, the kingdom's moving forward. I, I, if I want to see that advancing, I need to stand on the front line. I need to be like John and say, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this battle, but I'm going to see the mighty hand of God because I'm moving where God's moving. 
God delights to save through those who trust in him. And if my delight is to see the Lord move mightily, I will surrender everything else for that. I close with the words of two faithful Christians who have gone before us. One of them maybe is more familiar to you than the other, but I think they're both fairly known. I close with them because they, they lived with confidence, trusting in the Lord. That, that they, These two men, they, they stepped out in ways that the world said, wow, why are you doing that? Or you're a fool. First is 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 Jim Elliot. Maybe you're familiar with his, his famous quote. His more well-known quote is this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. But I want to add another quote to that one. He says this. God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. I'm going to go where you give the opportunity, I don't know the outcome. The choice is up to you, but I'm going to faithfully follow. And then the other is Oswald Chambers, who died in 1917. Maybe you're familiar with his, his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. He wrote this, Trust God and do the next thing. How simple how much faith is in those few words trust God and do the next thing let us step out trusting fully in the one who we know is not hindered by anything to save and that we would be emboldened by his power his authority to move in mighty ways and wait to see his mighty hand let's pray Lord God, as we look at this text, we, we see a young man from millennium ago whose faith in your promises, whose trust in, in who you are as his God emboldened him to, to step out in faith even when he did not know what the outcome would be. Well, God, I pray that you would make us a people like that. That we would be so confident in our God, in his power and ability, that we would trust him and do the next thing. God, if, if we desire to see you move mightily here in St. Joe and, and through the ends of the earth, Lord, I, we need that faith. So I plead, Lord, send your spirit to bring conviction. Have your spirit renew our faith again and again and again when we face things that we think are hopeless that, that our spirit would be engulfed by your spirit and that we would raise our eyes and say nothing can hinder God from saving whether in many or by few and that we would joyfully celebrate that we know this to be a reality because he has saved us from the greatest enemy through Christ Jesus. Oh God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.